Okay, so you got morphine elixir, right? 20 milligrams Q2 around the clock. So that's an around the clock um, uh, dosing. So that how many doses would this patient have gotten? 12, right? So it'd be 20 milligrams times 12 doses. Is that correct? So what do we get? 240 milligrams of oral morphine equivalent. What would you provide? So if we're going to do MS cotton, which is basically just long acting, I'm recording this, so I'll post it. Um, 240, if we're going to convert to MS cotton and we're going to do twice a day, that would be 120 milligrams of MS cotton Q12. Do you guys agree? 10% is breakthrough. So that would be breakthrough pain would be 24 milligrams of IR morphine. And then you could do, depending on the patient, every Q two to four hours. If it's outpatient, you'd probably be a little more conservative. If it's inpatient and it's like cancer pain, you'd be want to be a little more aggressive, right? Every two to four hours. Oops. Now, the quickest way that you can get into trouble and lose credibility is if you actually recommend something that doesn't exist. 24 milligrams doesn't, a 24 milligram tablet doesn't really exist. However, immediate release morphine comes in a 15 and a 30, or you'd have to use the liquid Roxanol, right? I'm not going to, I'm not going to nickel and dime you guys on an exam. I just want you to consider, if you're going to recommend something, make sure that you can get to that dose with available formulations. Right? All right, let's try another one. 10 milligrams sub-Q morphine, Q4 around the clock. So that's how many doses would the patient get? 10 milligrams times six doses would be what? 60 milligrams of IV, because subcutaneous is parenteral, right? IV slash sub Q morphine. What's, how do we get to oral morphine from here? What's the IV to PO conversion? Hmm? One to three, good. So if we've got 60 milligrams, we take 60 milligrams of IV times three, would give you what? 180 milligrams of oral morphine equivalents. You need to take that to MS Cotton. So theoretically, it would be, if, if it came in a dose like this, it would be 90 milligrams, let's call it CR morphine. How's that? CR morphine, 90 milligrams Q12. Do you guys agree? What would the breakthrough dose be? What do you think? 18. IR morphine, let's just say Q4 hours, PRN. Fair enough? I'll post all this, so don't worry about typing it. Just pay attention. And I'll post a recording of this after class. The patient's receiving Percocet 5325, two tabs, Q3. How much, how much oxycodone per dose? Per dose, 10, okay, so 10 milligrams of oxycodone, and then how many doses a day are they getting? Eight, so what's the total oxycodone dose? 80 milligrams oxycodone per day. So if we're gonna do CR oxycodone or oxycontin, that's a twice a day. That would be equal to 40 milligrams of CR oxycodone Q12. Do you guys agree? It's easy, right? Super easy. What's your breakthrough? Eight. So breakthrough pain, eight milligrams of IR oxycodone, let's say Q4 HPRN. 
eight milligrams is going to be tough to get to. So you're going to either have to go with five or with 10. What, what do you guys think? Yeah. Yes. You'd say five. Okay. Okay. Five is conservative. That'd be a little less than 10%. 10 is a little more than 10%. There's no right or wrong answer. I'd probably say 10. What do you mean PRN like dosing? That it's like, two to four hours or four hours. Well, okay. So the question is for the recording, how do we know whether it's Q2 hours, Q4 hours, whatever? You, you really don't, unfortunately. Um, a lot of practitioners like in, like, you know, we've got uh, Adam with us today who was in pain clinic this morning. And, you know, a lot of times in practice, we'll go with Q6 just because that's the quantity we want to send out. However, remember the length of analgesia for most of these drugs is four hours. So depending on what you're treating, you know, let's assume we're treating cancer pain and we want to go by the book. I mean, four hours is going to be about the length of time one of these breakthrough drugs should last. All right, Avenza is just a long acting morphine that's actually just recently got taken off the mar market. So 360 milligrams POQD, patient can no longer swallow, converted to a perineural infusion. Patient's not in pain, what's the appropriate hourly basal rate? So what's their oral morphine equivalent per day? 360, it's right there for you, right? 360 milligrams of oral morphine equivalent. What's the 24-hour IV morphine equivalent? What's 360 divided by three? Damn, this math's easy, isn't it? 120, you think it's a coincidence that these doses are the way they are? I, 120 milligrams IV daily equivalent. So how do you come up with an hourly basal rate? 120 divided by 24. What do you get? Anyone have a calculator? Five. So five milligrams of IV morphine per hour. That's how you would replace that drug in the hospital. Easy, right? Huh? Okay, we'll get to that. Um, typically, so we're going to talk about this in lecture today, but typically on it, like if it's a PCA, PCA bolus dose is usually 50% to 100% of the hourly rate. So what would their bolus dose be here? Two and a half to five milligrams, right? Is that it? Are those all our questions? Oh. Eh, don't worry about rectal morphine. Nobody likes rectal stuff. There's a lot of rectal on here. Let's try the Tylenol 3 conversion, shall we? So how much codeine is this? What's in Tylenol 3? Do you guys know? We're, this is an official class. We're just farting around. <laughs> How much? Tylenol 3 has how much codeine in it? 30, right? So we have 30 milligrams of codeine per tablet. How many tabs is each dose? Two tablets. So 60 milligrams per dose. And how many doses is this patient getting? Four times four equals how much codeine per day? 240 milligrams of oral codeine daily. Well, let's go back to our chart. How much codeine equals morphine? So there's a couple different ways you guys could do this. 
you could multiply by um, what would that be? You'd multiply by 30 and divide by 200. Or the easier way for me to do it is to figure out what the conversion factor is. So I'll divide 200 by 30. And that gives me a conversion factor of about six, six and a half or so. Again, it's not exact science. So if it's 240 milligrams of oral codeine daily, if we divide that by 6.6, 6, six and a half, whatever you want to call it. What's our oral morphine equivalent? <laughs> Roughly. 40, 50 milligrams, somewhere in there? 30 to 40? How much is it? Let's call it 40 milligrams of oral morphine equivalent per day. All right, now here's the catcher, guys. And we kind of talked about this on Friday, is notice the, notice the, um, notice the, uh, the statement that it's pain-free, okay? So because the patient's pain-free and we're converting due to dosing, we'd want to reduce because we're switching between drugs for like 25 to 30%, all right? So now we know what our morphine is, then we can go to oxycodone. I mean, we could have gone straight to oxycodone here if you wanted to from codeine. It's, just, it's all preference, whatever you want to do. You can either take it to morphine, then go to oxycodone, or go straight to oxycodone. So what would that be, 20 to 30? So if it's 40 of oral morphine, it'd be roughly 30 milligrams of oral oxycodone per day. Is that, do you guys agree with that? Sound about right? If you wanted to reduce it because of lack of cross tolerance, yep. Reduce for cross tolerance because patient is pain free. Now you're at 20 milligrams of oral oxycodone daily. We want to go to long-acting oxycodone, oxycontin. So voila, 10 milligrams of CR oxycodone Q12. Make sense? I kind of like this lecture and sitting down. This is nice. Are you guys following? Okay. What time is it? We got five minutes. Okay. Now patient number seven, the one we just did, is experiencing pain. Would you reduce for lack of cross tolerance? Probably not. So if the patient is not controlled when you're converting, a lot of times we will not convert for lack of cross tolerance because we want to be a little more aggressive with the opioid dosing. So I would probably say here, Adam, if I make a screw up, you'll let me know, right, bud? All right. I would probably say here, realistically, we'd be talking about 15 milligrams of CR oxycodone Q12 because we didn't reduce for cross tolerance, 30%. Let me put that in there so that. Ooh, Oxycontin 40 Q12 convert to transdermal fentanyl. Booyah. Is that still a word? Okay, 40 Q12, how much oxycodone per day? 80 milligrams of oxycodone. How much morphine is that? Roughly. How much? Okay, I agree with that. 120 milligrams of oral morphine equivalent. Did I teach you guys the, the quick and dirty two to one trick on Friday? Okay, so how much 
theoretically is that fentanyl patch. How much? 60 mics per hour. Fentanyl. Is it coming that? No. So I'd say let's be conservative. Go with 50 microgram per hour patch. Do we have to reduce for cross tolerance? Not with fentanyl. That's figured into the equation. Really quickly, what's, what's the one thing you would want to tell people if you're going to start them on a fentanyl patch? Takes 12 to 18 to kick in, 12 to 18 to, to wear off. Do not apply heat to a fentanyl patch. Have you guys heard that before? Do not apply heat to a fentanyl patch. Bless you. Transdermal fentanyl, 200 mic per hour patch. We see it. He is not in pain, but we want to start him on an IV morphine infusion. He just got admitted to the hospital, right? So what's his oral morphine equivalent here? 200 mic per hour patch, two to one rule. What's the oral morphine equivalent? 400 milligrams of oral morphine equivalent. What's this IV? 125, something like that? What's 400 divided by three? Hundred and oh good lord. Okay, hundred and thirty. Let's do it right so nobody yells. Hundred and thirty-three milligrams of IV morphine per day. You want to do a continuous IV infusion. One hundred and thirty-three divided by twenty-four. What do you get? Five and a half. You could do that. I mean, that's not crazy. Five point five milligrams of IV morphine per hour. That's your infusion rate of morphine. Is this helpful? Okay. Patients receiving transdermal fentanyl 50 mics per hour patch, not in pain and is willing and able to swallow. Convert to an equivalent regimen using Oxycontin. How much oral morphine is a 50 mic per hour patch? 50 mic per hour patch equals how much morphine? 100 milligrams oral morphine equivalent. That's per day, remember? Okay, now we got to go to oxycodone. How much oxycodone is 100 milligrams of morphine? Roughly? Sixty-ish? Seventy? Sixty? Well, we, we're going to use, so let's do 70. I'll show you why. So 70 milligrams, what the heck? 70 milligrams of oral oxycodone daily. Now, what's the magic, the magic words? He is not in pain, right? So we are going to reduce for lack of cross tolerance. Reduce 30%. Now where are we at? 70 times 0.7, 50. So our CR oxycodone dose, if it came in this, would be 25 milligrams Q12. Yes, ma'am. Why didn't we reduce in number 10? Oh, sorry, 10 milligrams. He is not in pain. Oh, we should have here. <coughs> oh, wait, we don't have to reduce with the fentanyl, going to and from fentanyl. What about 11? 11. We should have. We did. Right? Right. 
Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. I'm screwing you guys up, aren't I? Usually when you go from fentanyl to another drug, you don't need to reduce because it's factored into the calculator. So let me rephrase that. Reduce. So we'll say 35, right? Don't reduce because coming from fentanyl. Should I probably save this? All right, he developed pain, acetaminophen, patient. would like to start a PRN opioid. What opioid regimen would you recommend? Well, good Lord, there's no... How many of y'all want to do hydrocodone? Oh, class is officially starting now. You guys want to, how many want to do hydrocodone? How many want to do oxycodone? How many want to do tramadol with acetaminophen? They want to start a PRN opioid. Got to pick one. There's probably no right or wrong answer here. Okay, how, how frequently would you dose it? Every two hours? Every four hours? I don't know. I might go with every six hours as needed, but it depends how, how disabled the guy was. All right. I'm not gonna give you guys anything as complicated as these towards the end. I just want you guys to have a feel of how this goes. How would you guys feel about me just, because I'm, I'm recording off my computer to the, to the Zoom thing. How would you guys feel about me just jumping in and rocking from here? Would that be okay? Do I need the mic? Can you guys hear me okay in the back? All right, let's rock it out. Let's just do this. No, it's recording to my laptop right now. I'm on, uh, I'm using iTunes, what's that called, Apple TV? I don't know how to do this though. All right, so this is where we left off on Friday, right? Risk mitigation. How in the world do we keep people from abusing their opioids? Like the lady from this morning that finally admitted that she thought her kids were dipping into her oxycodone correct so basically what we have to do is is and everybody everybody is equally responsible for this this is not the prescriber's job it's not the pharmacist's job it's not the patient's job and it's not the dea's job it's all of our jobs to ensure that these drugs are being used safely and so the whole overarching concept of using an opioid safely is risk mitigation strategies We'll also call this universal precautions. How do we keep people safe on these drugs? The number one thing I can tell you guys when we are actually seeing a patient in the clinic is you need to specifically assess each time that you see that patient what we call the four A's. And that stands for analgesia, activity, adverse effects, and aberrant drug-taking behaviors. And really what that means is that if you're not paying particular attention to each one of those, every time you see a patient, you are at risk of being coined a pill mill by the DEA. You guys know what a pill mill is? Did anybody go home and watch Oxycontin Express like I told them to? How many of y'all did not do your homework this weekend? Shame on you. If you, have not, if you didn't do it, take 45 minutes and watch it. Not, no, not right now. <laughs> Not right now. Okay. So we want to pay particular attention to these things. Do we, do we assume, why do we care about adverse effects? Other than providing good patient care, what about our patient that was on 200 mic fentanyl patch? Would we expect that patient to have some constipation? What do you guys think? How about itching or sedation? 
we probably expect some of those things. The patient comes in and like, nope, I'm pooping like a champ. What does that lead you to maybe think of? Ooh, maybe they're not putting the patch on them, but cutting it up and sharing it, right? Okay, the other part of universal precautions or risk mitigation are things called drug screening, which is pretty self-explanatory, pill counts, prescription monitoring programs, and the risk evaluation tools. Urine drug screens are pretty self-explanatory. We have them pee in a cup. We try to figure out if it's actually their pee or somebody else's pee or water or the toilet water, what else? Well, you know, whatever else it might be. So, I mean, we, I am not joking. We have had patients when we used to put the blue dye in the toilet, they would actually dip the urine cups in the toilet and put a cap on it. I'm like, I don't care where you are from, nobody's pee is blue <laughs> and cold, okay? So we'll do urine drug screen, and I'll, I'll show you a couple tricks with that here in a minute. Pill counts, we will do pill counts. Do you know why we do pill counts? Because what they'll do is, is they'll sell some of their drug and they'll save one dose to, pay, to take right before they come in to see you. So we may give them a month's worth and have them come back in three weeks, and we ask them to bring all of their drug in the um, original container. Now, don't let the MAs and the nurses do the pill count. The provider needs to do the pill count. Would you guys believe that almost 90% of the patients that we've caught having difficulties with their medications blame you guys? for their faulty amounts of pills, the pharmacist shorted me. Because you guys are pretty careless when you count those things, right? You only count them three times and put red tape on them and do all the other stuff? Nope, they shorted me 15 tablets. You need to call them. We hear it all the time, don't we? By the way, that's Adam in the back. He's a PGY1 resident at St. Easy's on a pain management rotation with me right now. All right. Prescription drug monitoring programs. You guys ever get into the Illinois Prescription Drug Monitoring Program? You guys seen it? Okay. Full disclosure, I'm on the, the secret big brother committee or the peer review committee. There's five of us that pull that data every month for the entire state and we look at it. And we look at, not at the patient standpoint, we look at it from the prescriber standpoint. And we're actually working right now on how do we identify the bad kids? And so Adam's using his mathematical wizardry to come up with how do we plug all of this, I mean, hundreds of thousands of data points into a file and come up with, here's our pill mills. Because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the guy who's operating out of the back of his Chevy Suburban takes cash only, you know what I'm talking about. Who watched OxyContin Express? You did, you're the only one in the class, you get a bonus point. You did? So that's the kind of crap we're trying to avoid. You had a question over here? I did. I was wondering, for those monitoring programs, um, do you think it would look like this? Yes. Okay. Um, how soon after doing something filled that a pharmacist does it get uploaded into that? The question is, how quickly do we actually get access to it? Legally, it's supposed to be within seven days. It can vary anywhere from a couple days up to a couple weeks. We are working on changing the legislation where it's done daily, real time. Most other PMPs are real time. And I don't know how many of you guys have seen this, but it's a really big problem, is I will go into the PMP and I'll search for something. I think it happened today, actually where I know they got this drug and it's not in there. I know they got it. And the other big problem is the incorrect DEA numbers going in. So how else can we mitigate risk from opioids? The other big piece of this is making sure that we're selecting the right patients to even trial on these things. And believe it or not, there's a couple of what we call risk screening tools. This, uh, on this slide, there's, this is just a couple of the ones that we'll frequently use. You guys will get the opportunity to, to practice with these a little bit in your case thingios that you call, whatever you call them later in the week. What do they call that? Case, just case, okay. But what these do is, is these are validated odds ratio based tools where 
if you answer yes to a certain number of these, the odds are that you are at higher risk than the next guy or gal to develop a drug abuse problem if you are exposed to opioid analgesics. The general population, if I take this entire class and I expose you to a week's worth of opioid, generally speaking, somewhere between 20 and 25% of you will develop aberrant drug-taking behaviors, problematic drug-taking, 25% or so, all right? probably around 10% will go on to develop true substance use disorder. How do we predict this? We really cannot do that. These tools just provide another point on the map. So they'll take into consideration, have you had a previous history of alcohol abuse? Did you smoke? Do you have depression? All the things that we know are risk factors for substance use disorder. The, one, the, the ones that we will actually use in clinic we use the opioid risk tool, and we use the uh, COMM, which stands for the Current Opioid Misuse Measure. And so actually, every patient that comes in to see us, every visit, is asked to fill out one of these COM scores. And we add it up, and if you're greater than, what's the cutoff, Adam, nine? If you're at or more than nine on this, you are at an increased risk of misuse. When we talk about drug screens, there's basically two types. Everybody in here has been drug screened, right? Did anybody have problems with their drug screen? Obviously not, or you wouldn't be here, right? The drug screen that they do for you guys here is called a chain of custody drug screen. That means they probably watched you pee. Did they watch you pee? They're supposed to, because it's a chain of custody. They're supposed to be able to watch it come out of the orifice, into the cup, sealed, and into the, the lab machinery, okay? So that is called chain of custody. Otherwise, it's just a regular urine drug screen. And there's two different types of drug screens. There's immunoassay. The immunoassay is basically, I don't know, how would you describe that? Kind of like PCR, right? It's basically, a, it's a, it goes in and uh, looks for... Um, uh, reactions to what things that look like this particular drug. You can have false positives. You can have false negatives, right? Oh, I had a poppy seed bun, right? That's a possibility with immunoassays. What you all had done when you did your drug screen was an immunoassay. When you, I think most of you either use lab or lab, uh, LabCorp or Quest, that's an immunoassay. Now, if we find a positive on there, let's say we find a positive meth or cocaine and the drug screens we use in our clinic, I don't feel right changing somebody's drug therapy or medical course around based on something that could have a false positive. Because there are reports of anti-inflammatories like NSAIDs causing false positive marijuana or there are reports of beta-lactam antibiotics causing false positive um, cocaines. There are reports of some of the nasal sprays. What's the, is it Afrin that has le, le, the little inhalers that have basically methamphetamine, like a isomer of methamphetamine in them. And you use enough of those, you could trigger a positive meth, okay? Now what we do is, is we send everything for GCMS confirmation. So when we get your P at our clinic, traditionally most clinics will screen it first and see if anything pops positive. It's a lot cheaper and it's a lot quicker. In fact, they have actually little cups that will tell you right away if something's in there or not. And we have that technology at our, our clinic where we can dip it and we can tell within two minutes whether something's positive or negative. If it's positive for a drug that we don't think should be there, I can't go back in good conscience and say, you're doing meth, you're fired. I feel like we need to send it for actual GCMS confirmation. Gas, chromatography, mass spectrometry. When those come back positive, it's in there. I don't know how it got in there. You could have rubbed it all over your skin. I've had people tell me they 
fell while they were rehabbing a house into a huge pile of cocaine. We'll get every story known to man. The bottom line, were you on rotation when that guy told us that? He was rehabbing a house and tore down a wall and he fell into a big thing of cocaine. And that's why it was positive. Whatever. I don't know why it is, but that is in your body, period. It's cocaine and it is in your body. And this is how much is in your body. We know that. There is no such thing as a false positive with GCMS. It's there. End of discussion. Okay? Every, that's a big take-home point. Immunoassay, yeah, there's some problems. GCMS, it's there, period. Patients will try to explain that away. Oh, and they know more than you ever have about false positives on drug screens because they've Googled it. They know about golden seal and this and that and everything else. If we find it on a GCMS, it's in. Now, has anyone ever heard of the Wizenator? Do you guys know what the Wizenator is? The Wizenator is something you can buy for men and women. It is flesh tone matched apparatus that you wear that looks like your uh, respective genitalia. I guess that's the most professional way to say it. And inside of it is stored a sample of urine that is clean that obviously is held right up against you so it's at body temperature. And then you can express it for directly observed chain of custody drug screens. This is a real thing. Don't Google it in here, but go home on your own computer and take a look, okay? Now, the other thing we come in to play frequently with is, well, I don't understand, I just took it. And we had this conversation this morning. We had a lady with rheumatoid arthritis on oxycodone and acetaminophen, and she's had three negative urine drug screens over the past, what, two, three years, something like that, two tree, two tree years, okay? So much to the point that this was an issue that we genotyped her for poor being a, a rapid metabolizer of the enzymes, okay? This is your length of detection time on average for parent and metabolite. So on average, if you've been taking morphine regularly and you're at steady state, I expect to be able to find that for three to four days after your last dose. Same with oxycodone. I mean, this isn't an exact science, but if they tell you, I just took my dose this morning and it comes back negative, they're full of crap. Sorry, that's just the way it is, all right? The other big one that a lot of people ask me about is marijuana. Marijuana is very lipophilic, and because there's so many different phytocannabinoids that float around after you smoke it, that it can vary anywhere from a couple days all the way out to 30 days that you can find that in your urine. I don't wanna get into the politics in this class of what do you do if you find positive marijuana and you're giving a patient opioids? That's provider specific. I'll tell you what we do at our clinic. We shake our finger and say, we can't find it again. We're a federal facility. The other ones, we're done. Okay? Any questions about length of time of detection? What do you think would be a good question to ask a patient that you're doing risk mitigation for? at your family medicine clinic. They come in, they're on hydrocodone and acetaminophen. What's something you'd want to know if you know you're going to drug screen them? When was your last dose? Absolutely. You know what my other favorite question is? I'm drug screening you today. What am I going to find? Anything you need to tell me about? So we can you know, get off your chest now because I'm going to find it. What's in there? Sometimes I don't even have to do one. I did heroin. Were you there for the puff guy? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I think it was two weeks ago. Well, I might have taken a puff. Of what? I'm thinking he's going to tell me mar marijuana. Heroin. A puff? Okay. 
guys, let me put this into some context. Let's say you're the pharmacist and you, and you guys are probably looking at me like, we're not going to be doing this. Why is this guy wasting time talking about this in therapeutics class? Right now, if you get online, there are at minimum 20 jobs, 20 jobs across the country for advanced practice pharmacists to do nothing but opioid risk mitigation work in large internal medicine and family medicine clinics. So basically doing what I do every day. This is out there. And they like you guys. Why do they think... Why do you think they like pharmacists doing this work? Because you guys know this stuff. You know the metabolites. You know what can affect it. And you know BS when you hear it, right? Don't you feel like we have a really good BS sniffer? It's like ingrained. Okay. Any questions with UDS? Yeah. So say like your roommates are very heavy Oh, yeah. My roommate's a big smoker or I was in a VW van. Okay. <laughs> Quickly, without going, this is something that there is a ton of data on, okay? Now, in the old days, when the, urine, the, when the immunoassays were like 300 nanograms per mil detection limit, it was impossible for you to get a contact high positive marijuana screen. It was impossible. We could lock you in a, you know, a VW bus with Spicoli and Cheech and Chong and all the others, and it would still come back negative. Unfortunately, the drug screens we use now are so sensitive that we are actually now starting to see that we can start to pop, uh, pop positive at as little as 15 to 20 nanograms per mil on a, on a really high sensitivity screen. So as our testing gets better, that becomes more feasible. We actually have, that we've actually had a patient that was testing positive for methamphetamine because her boyfriend was using methamphetamine and methamphetamine concentrates in certain bodily fluids and there was transfer of drug that way. So because we, our tests are so sensitive, we, it can actually happen, yes. Okay, so we guys, we doing all right? You guys having fun? Is this working, me sitting here? I feel, I don't wanna lose, I don't want people in the back falling asleep. I don't feel like I'm, are you moving up? <laughs> We're having a gum crisis. Juicy fruit works better. Okay, so I've talked a lot about opioids, opioid use, how do we treat pain? And this was one we this was a big another big one we had this morning is how do we treat pain without using opioids? And if you can come up with the right answer to that question, you will be a millionaire. Period. If you can come up with a great way to treat somebody's pain without using opioids and it be effective all the time, you will be walking in tall cotton, okay? Here are our co-analgesics or our adjuvant analgesics. These are the drugs that we can use as analgesics that are not opioids. Probably the better term for these is non-opioid analgesics, all right? Adjuvant usually means they're used in addition to Co-analgesics may be that we can use them in addition to an opioid or with or without. Obviously, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories can be used by themselves as an analgesic or with another agent. However, we don't typically see anticonvulsants and antidepressants used by themselves as analgesics for, say, a musculoskeletal pain complaint. It can be done. But you don't go into the ER and someone say, here's your gabapentin for your broken arm, right? It just doesn't happen very frequently. You can use anesthetics in that regard, and you can use skeletal muscle relaxants for a hurt back. These are your insets, okay? The reason that I put these up and split them this way is that I want everybody to remember this class of drugs not as just insets, but I want them to think of these drugs as five completely separate chemical subtypes. The reason that I do that is, is that too often in our clinic, we have patients that come in and say, I've tried ibuprofen, I've tried naproxen. Is this thing working? You never close your eyes. All right. Where's the other thing at? Here we go. All right. Are we back in business? So, all of these NSAIDs, right, are going to be, are going to be 
differential based on their chemical structure. The drugs on the left, the non salicylates, typically have lower effects on platelet eye bleed just because they're very, very weak cyclooxygenase inhibitors. Okay, they're thought more to work at uh, other um, inflammatory mediators like uh, tumor necrosis factor and uh, I'm going to mess this up, brain-derived natriuretic peptide. Did I get that right? Okay. So they're kind of weird insets, but they're still non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. All right. The other thing that I want to make sure that we keep in mind is, did I show this to you guys in, in GI room, this table? Okay, so you've seen this before. It's nothing new. You'll see it again. Um, the bottom line here is, is that the whole theory that celecoxib or Brex is the only COX-2 selective drug left on the market is horse crap. Continuum, really. The, all of the true COX-2 selective drugs that are up at the top are no longer on the market in the U.S. And so in actuality, our most COX-2 selective rate, uh, inset based on IC50 ratios of those different cyclooxygenase drugs is a totalac. Now, clinically, is there really that big of a difference between a totalac, diclofenac, celecoxib, or meloxicam based on that? It's tough to say. It's tough to say. And we don't have data to say, oh, celecoxib is much better for the stomach than meloxicam is. They're never going to do that study. It's always based on older drugs that are non-selective. Now, looking at this, do you think Toradol or Ketorolac would have a higher incidence of GI bleed or GI risk based on its COX selectivity? Remember, COX-1 is, is uh, anti-platelet. COX-2 is pro-platelet. What do you think? Ketorolac riskier for GI bleed than naproxen? Yes or no? Way riskier. Hell yeah. Okay. If I were you guys, I would put in the back of my mind a Totalac, Celecoxib, Meloxicam. Those are kind of your players for the COX-2 drugs. And the, and the rest of them are going to be fairly non-selective except for Ketorolac. That's the big boy. How long can you give Ketorolac or Toradol for in, in a row? Five days. Is that what you said? Three days, five days. Five days is the labeled duration. Now, the big question that always comes up is, well, how long do you have to wait until you do another five days? I don't know. If you can figure that out, there's another publication. Ooh, capstone. That'd be a good capstone project. We could give a bunch of healthy people five days of Toradol and then see how bad it hurts their kidneys. Okay. Now, this is the big thing coming up, is topical insets. Everybody's using these drugs now, okay? We have, you can, you can have them compounded. You can have pretty much have anything you want compounded, right? These are the three that are commercially available for pain. They're all three diclofenac. I'll tell you that diclofenac, oral diclofenac, as I said, is a nasty drug because of cardiovascular risk. It probably has one of the highest odds ratios of cardiovascular risk compared to the other insets. Topical diclofenac, however, is the bee's knees. The stuff works very well. These are your three different products. There's a patch you can slap on. There's a gel you can rub in. There's a, like a foamy solution pump you get that's really expensive called, you seen Pensed? It's good stuff. Pensed, this stuff down here is actually combined with something called dimethyl sulfoxide which is supposed to be a permeability enhancer. But really it does is make your breath smell like garlic. You guys ever heard that before? People use DMSO, it always smells like they're warding off vampires. Now, is topical diclofenac safer than regular diclofenac? Probably, probably. And these are the C-maxes for the various products that are out there. It probably is. But we don't have good data to for sure say that they are. So if you go down, if you go to a nephrology 
conference, you know, the kidney people, and you ask them, should you use topical NSAIDs in somebody with renal failure or renal compromise? Half of them will tell you it's fine, and the other half are like, uh, I wouldn't do it. And we just don't have great data to support that it is, in fact, absolutely safe. Because you know what this Voltaren gel, this 53 nanogram per mil level is, even though it's hardly anything at all, it's still there. It's still in your system. You're still getting systemic exposure. So I don't know. I don't know. And I think we're jumping to conclusions, assuming that, that it, the risk is lower. But as of right now, I think most people do. Okay? All right. Any questions about the insets? So let me ask this. Real quick before we move on to anticonvulsants. If I asked you guys to... to monitor a patient on an inset. For instance, we had a guy on meloxicam every day, been on it for, I don't know what, a year or two. What do you want to know? What pops into your head when you see a patient that's getting ibuprofen, meloxicam, naproxen every day for years and years and years? What are you worried about? What's the number one thing you're worried about? GI bleed. Okay, perfect. How do you monitor GI bleed? Ask. Okay. No pun intended. Get it? Okay, you can do a fecal occult blood test. That's where they, you wipe a little poo on a card and squirt some developer on it, and it'll tell you if there's blood in it or not. A lot of us will have blood in our stools from drinking or aspirin use or whatever. So it's a way to monitor it. What's an easier way? How many of you have ever wiped your own poo on a, like a Polaroid, Polaroid picture? No? No one's ever done that? So it, it kind of, it's a, it's, we have those in our exam rooms and we can do it. What's an easier way to see if somebody's bleeding? Just get a CBC, right? And if, if they've got a long, slow history of GI bleed, it'll come back well. But you're right, a hemocult test is very appropriate if you suspect an NSAID induced GI bleed. Do you know there's an iPhone app for that? There's a hemocult iPhone app. Look it up when you get out of class. You do wipe your butt on it, I guess. There is a iPhone app, I swear. Okay. What else are you worried about besides GI bleed? So he, hemoglobin hematocrit would be one way to monitor it, as well as a hemocult or stool guaiac. What else are you guys worried about? Kidneys. How do we monitor kidneys? How do you monitor kidneys, guys? Serum creatinine. What test is that in? Do we just monitor serum creatinine? Just get a Chem 7 or a BMP or whatever they call it. What else are we worried about with insets? Is that it? CV risk. So how do you monitor for a heart attack? Have you had a heart attack? Okay. So you want to consider the CV risk based on the actual patient you're seeing? Are they at high risk or have they had an event? You want to think about their kidneys. What's their serum creatinine? When did you check them last? And not just what is their serum creatinine, what is it doing? Is it trending down? Okay, are you creating problems for this patient? And what's their hemoglobin doing? Are they bleeding slowly? Because where are you most likely to bleed from internally? Your gut, right? That's the most likely cause for a bleed internally is from your GI system. And what's the most common cause? Either NSAIDs or colorectal cancer. Those are your two primary reasons for internal bleeding. Period. Did you know that NSAID-induced GI bleed is the number one cause for drug-related hospital admissions in the U.S.? Drug-related hospital admissions. Next is insulin and then warfarin. Okay. Are we good with NSAIDs? So if I had a patient on an NSAID on an exam and I'm like, what would you like to monitor? Everyone in here is going to say something about bleeding, hemoglobin, stool guaiac, CBC, and everybody's going to say something about kidneys, right? Serum creatinine, creatinine clearance, one of them. You guys would get that. Everybody agree? All right. 
Let's move on to anticonvulsants. So this is another big area of adjuvant analgesia that we use. I'm not going to beat you up on these because you guys have already had all of these drugs in this class. Is that correct? So this is really kind of nice. It's like a twofer. All right. The first generation drugs are on the left. The second and third generation drugs are on the right. You should not really hear a bunch of new information in the next couple minutes from me. However, what I want to do is share with you guys a couple of kind of the clinical pearl type things that we deal with in our clinic. All right? So from a utility of pain standpoint, these are the drugs that have data in chronic pain. These are the drugs that have data in chronic pain. And, it, and a little level of evidence, the tick marks are basically what quality of data we have to support their use. Obviously, carbamazepine is going to be our big go-to drug for chronic pain. What's the big thing you got to worry about with carbamazepine? I heard SJS. What else? Hyponatremia? You guys are good. Anything else? Aplastic anemia. Those are the big three. Congratulations. All right. The other older drug that we will sometimes use for chronic pain is valproic acid or divalproex. However, what's the big side effect with that drug that nobody wants? Weight gain. It causes a lot of weight gain. And that's pretty hard. That's a tough sell to somebody with type 2 diabetes, right? Now, would these drugs be great for strain, sprain and strain, musculoskeletal stuff? Probably not great. But where they are very effective is in chronic pain syndromes that are more neuropathic in nature or more centrally mediated in nature. Okay? So like your nerve pain type syndromes. I can't believe somebody did a pain study with phenytoin. Dilantin. What did, what did you guys learn about dilantin? That it's gross? It causes a lot of problems. You guys have the Monday afternoon blast, huh? All right. Here's the newer drugs. Whoa, this is a bunch. This is a bunch of drugs. The big ones up here that I think most of you guys could probably attest to that are frequently used in chronic pain are gabapentin and pregabalin. All right, they have a wealth of data. We really know how to use them. We're pretty sure they're effective. I'll tell you what we usually see with gabapentin and pregabalin, they're underdosed. That's probably what we see more commonly than anything else is they're like, hey doc, this doesn't work. And they're on like 100 milligrams of gabapentin three times a day. Okay? Generally speaking, generally speaking, you shouldn't even start thinking about assessing the effectiveness of gabapentin for pain until you get at or above 900 a day. That's pretty much the minimum effective dose. Does anyone know the conversion between gabapentin and pregabalin? Do you know you can convert those drugs? One-sixth. One-sixth. So if I'm on 1,200 milligrams of gabapentin a day, divide that by six, that's your pregabalin dose. So what about some of these other anticonvulsants that are up here? I think it's important we share with you some of the others that we actually use in practice regularly. Okay? Some of the others that we frequently use include topiramate and zonisamide. Topiramate, obviously, is topamax. Zonisamide is zonagran. Very, very similar drugs. They're both very weak carbonic and hydrase inhibitors. So the big a telltale with those two drugs is, number one, they can cause some weight loss, not a bad thing for some patients, and they can also contribute to kidney stones or nephrolithiasis, kidney stones or nephrolithiasis.
The other big one on here that I will frequently use in practice is oxcarbazepine or trileptal. We actually had a guy come in, he had uh, cervicalgia, neck pain, with radicular symptoms that shoot down into uh, one of his arms. I don't think you got, you saw the other guy, and I saw him. Um, and we started him on oxcarb uh, two weeks ago at a relatively low dose. Came back, he's like, I'm sleeping better, I feel better, I don't have as much pain shooting down my arm. Remember what neuropathic pain sounds like? Shooting, burning, radiating, pins and needles intermittent, those are like the neuropathic pain sounds that you'll hear from a patient, okay? And so he actually, like that, the pain helped him out. He's been on Pentin, we got him up to dose, it didn't work. And sometimes it doesn't. Let me ask you this. Oxcarbazepine is basically a prodrug of the metabolite of carbamazepine. Is that kind of the way that works? So what were our big ones with carbamazepine? I heard aplastic anemia, hyponatremia, and Stevens. Those are our big nasties. Same thing with oxcarb. You doing all right? Okay. You guys don't seem like you're as awake today. The big weekend, is it because football started? No. Yeah? Okay. So these are the big ones that we'll use. Most of us will use gabapentin before pergabalin, and I think it's pretty safe to say most of us will use gabapentin before the other drugs, but just because it's pretty benign. <clears throat> what do you have to worry about with gabapentin? I'm sorry? Drowsiness, that's one. Good. What else? While you guys are thinking about another one, I do this with my APPE students, but I challenge you guys when you come across drugs like this, I know it's hard when you're in therapeutics and you're getting all this crap thrown at you, but in the back of your a drug, try to think of like four or five things that just pop into your mind when you see it. Kind of like carbamazepine, what pops into your mind? Hyponatremia, A plus anemia, you know, and just try to visualize those things with that drug. I'll tell you what my five are for gabapentin. I think of how it works. It has nothing to do with GABA, right? It's a calcium channel blocker at alpha-2 delta. I think about sedation. I think about weight gain. I think about no drug interactions. Do you guys agree with that? No drug interactions with this, unlike carbamazepine that has every drug interaction. And I think about um, renal dosing. Did I already say that? You got to renally dose this drug. And if you know gabapentin, guess what drug now you know? Pregabalin. You got it. Same with topiramate. Can I share my big five for topiramate? Kidney stones, cognitive impairment, right? Dopamax, glaucoma, second closure glaucoma, carbonic anhydrase inhibition, weight loss. And I'm sure there's others that are out there that are important. Those are just the ones I remember. But I try to remember something about all of them, right? Now, you know the, that for topiramate, what do you know about zanisamide? The same. They work exactly the same. Now you guys know six anticonvulsants, carbamazepine, oxcarb, pregab, GABA, topiramate, zanisamide. Got them. Stone cold, right? All right. Let me throw let me throw one one or two more pearls down on the anticonvulsant side of things. How long do you guys think it takes for one of these drugs to work when you start it? Right away? Ooh, doc, I feel better. That burning pain in my legs, it's gone. When would you expect these drugs to really start working well? General rule of thumb. Four to six weeks. That's a long time to wait for pain relief, don't you think? 
So what do we find in practice? What we wind up seeing is a lot of patients aren't told that. They have unrealistic expectations. And so they're like, I took it for a week and quit. We hear that every single week. I took it. I did what you said. Didn't work. Make sure the patients know what the expectations are with these drugs. Some of them may work a little bit quicker, but for the most part, you're looking at right around a month before you start seeing really meaningful benefit. What do you guys think about skeletal muscle relaxants? These are fun drugs, but everybody prescribes them correctly, right? Two weeks and then they're off? Isn't that how they're indicated? No more than three weeks and then discontinued. That's what the labeling says. How many of you all fill cyclobenzaprine number 90, 20 refills all the time, right? Everybody. Why do you suppose that is? Do you think it's working? Do you think it's actually relaxing muscles? Why do people actually take these drugs? What's their big side effect? Sedation. They're all used as sleepers for the most part. Okay? The question is, is which one of them is the least evil of the bunch? That's really the way that we look at these drugs. And the other way, and I'm just, I'm just being frank with you, the other thing that I look at is, is which one of these would I rather a patient take than an opioid? So if I have to choose between somebody taking two Flexeril a day or two Vicodin a day, hey, if the Flexeril works for you, go for it. If, that, if, if you honestly believe that it's working for you, the data is not there. So it's not evidence-based medicine, but it is what it is. All right, a couple take-homes that we need to know about with these drugs. And this is really a... You know, a, a real nasty overview of, of what we think about with these individual drugs. Cyclobenzaprine, probably the most commonly one seen. You are basically looking at amitriptyline, period. Cyclobenzaprine is a tricyclic antidepressant. So it's going to have the same side effects. Anticholinergic, EKG, sedation. Tizanidine or Xanaflex, I'm sure you guys see that drug go out too. We really like that in our clinic. It works really well. The thing you got to keep in mind is, is that it is a centrally acting alpha agonist. Can you guys give me an example of another drug like that? Clonidine. Exactly. What does clonidine do? It lowers your blood pressure. So you can expect some blood pressure decreases with tizanidine. And what happens if you abruptly stop clonidine? You get rebound hypertension. You can expect the same thing with tizanidine. All right. The other big one up here that I want you guys to really know about is carosoprodol. Have you guys ever heard of that drug? Soma. It's the only one that works if you believe patients that come into our pain service. Right? Soma or carosoprodol is now a controlled substance. It's metabolized to meprobamate, which is a barbiturate, so it will screen positive on a drug screen for barbs. And it is also considered one of the Holy Trinity drug combinations. You guys ever heard that term? So that basically, when the PMP is digging around, they're looking for people who have a high number of Xanax, Vicodin, Soma patients. And I'm not talking about individually. I'm talking about how many patients does this prescriber have on all three of those drugs. And that is considered to be the holy grail of drug combinations for abuse. Yes, ma'am. If you have someone that's on all three from three different providers, I would make sure that all of the providers know that they're actually on all three. How you do that is up to you. I usually am, because, you know, and with, do you have time to do it? But really, that shouldn't be. It is your job, but it should be the prescriber's job. You know, obviously, they're not paying attention or they don't know that that's a bad combination. Yes. 
Xanax, Soma, and, and an opioid, any opioid. If you look at bluelight.com, they'll tell you that when you mix Soma and an opioid, it's like, oh, it's the most amazing thing ever. Better than any of the other skeletal muscle relaxants. They really like it. And I'm not making light of the abuse issue. So, pl I mean, don't, don't be offended that I'm talking like that. I'm just trying to convey that it's very highly sought after from an abuse standpoint. My favorite skull muscle relaxant on there, I almost didn't mention it. My favorite one is baclofen. That's my faith. I use that more than any other one. And I'll tell you why, and this is the corniest reason ever. But the reason that I use this the most is that we frequently use intrathecal baclofen for pain and for spasticity all the time, every day, all for years and years and years. And so I feel like I have more safe safety net or safe room to move as far as evidence to support me actually doing what I'm doing. And it t patients tend to tolerate it pretty well too. So we, we tend to use a lot of baclofen because at least then I know I'm not just throwing a sleeper at them, right? Does anyone actually ever recommend or, or see capsaicin go out? It's a shame because it's really an effective drug. Just nobody uses it long enough. So capsaicin actually is very reasonable. I think, I'm going to tell you guys my million dollar idea, don't go patent it. But I think personally that the, the cat's meow of pain management would be lidocaine. Like, you know how they have the lidocaine patches now that are over the counter? Have them put that on for like 12 hours and then take it off and rub capsaicin over that area. How cool would that be? Because what's the big side effect of capsaicin? Burning. And how long does the burning usually last before it goes away? Two weeks, two tree weeks, right? We don't use it long enough. People quit using it. It actually has very good data to support its use both in musculoskeletal and in neuropathic pain syndromes. There is also now an 8% patch called Quitenza. And basically the way this works is the doctor's office orders it in, they find the area of pain, they trace it with the marker, they cut out the patch, they put the patch over that area, they leave it on for um, one hour, and then they pull the patch off. You have to use a special uh, cleansing agent that counteracts and eliminates the capsaicin, and then you need to send them home with two or three days of opioid to counteract the burning that they're going to deal with. 8%, do you know what the stuff is that you guys have in the pharmacies? Like 0 0.04, point, right? I mean, 0 0.024, is that what you're saying? 0 0.4? That sounds high. Is that right? 0 0.75, 0 0.75 is one, didn't it? Or is it 0 0.075? You guys are useless to me. Okay. But imagine going to 8%. It's like putting a hot iron on your skin. But it works for three to four months for post-herpetic neuralgia. We don't need to get down into the details, but I want you guys to know that this exists. 0 0.1? Okay. Thank you. I'll take, I'll take any Dr. Google advice you got. The other big one is anesthetics. How do anesthetics work? Sodium channel blockers, every last one of them. And we have lidocaine, we have bupivacaine, we have prilocaine. We actually will compound these drugs into uh, uh, pain creams or gels to help out. You can get a lidocaine patch. It's now comes in two different versions, lidoderm and lidopatch. That's a 5%. And then you can get an over-the-counter 4%. They work. They work fairly well. They went in here, used the lidocaine patch? You just wait till you start getting old like me. They work. You've used one? They are not covering them? No, why would they cover them? There's an over-the-counter one now. In fact, I think that was a ploy of the insurance company bringing those to market. 
I think a box of four lidoderm lidocaine over-the-counter patches is like 15 bucks. They're pretty pricey, okay? But they do work. The other thing that we can do is, is after surgery, I can put a, a little catheter into the site of incision and I can actually infuse lidocaine or bupivacaine or one of those anesthetics directly into your, your surgical site and leave it in there for two or three days after the surgery. And it just slowly oozes uh, anesthetic into that area. And it really helps with post-operative pain. And then the last piece that we only use in really rare cases, but we have done it, is we'll do lidocaine infusions to help with really nasty refractory neuropathic pain syndrome, like complex regional pain syndrome. <clears throat> All right, let's take a few minutes to stretch our legs and wake up, and then we'll come back and we'll jump into pain syndromes. You guys are doing great. I'm proud of you.
Next. No? Perfect. Yes, ma'am. All right, we ready? Welcome back to the House of Pain. Here we go. Jump around, jump around in that House of Pain. Sing that. Then get down. Jump, jump, jump. Okay, pain syndromes. We are not going to try to cover all of these, but what I wanted to make sure that we had happen for you guys is that you kind of had an idea of the more common pain syndromes and where they might fit. All right? So we have a, obviously a pain. Remember, acute is less than 30 days. Remember that from Friday. And these are typically what you would see as being considered an acute pain. Sickle cell disease, labor and delivery, or uh, perinatal, post-op, procedural, and then sprain and strain. Those are all considered kind of primary acute pain syndromes. Then you have your neuropathic pain syndromes. And these can be the, you can have neuropathic pain following a stroke, an ischemic stroke. Most people don't talk about that. Have you guys even ever heard of that before? Central post-stroke pain syndrome? 30% of patients that have ischemic strokes can develop uh, neuropathic pain correlating with the regions of the stroke. You can have nutritional neuropathies. What's probably the most common nutritional neuropathy you might see? Oh, I haven't taught you guys that yet, have I? That's in Hemonc. B12 deficiency can cause neuropathic pain. All right? And then we have peripheral neuropathies. The most common is going to be diabetic, but you can also see it from chemotherapy. And then your neuralgias, which is a painful and sensory deprivation, like trigeminal neuralgia, which is going to be of the trigeminal nerve, and postherpetic neuralgia, which is going to be um, uh, is going to be after you've had shingles. Sorry, I had a. <laughs> there used to be a guy that we went to school with, and his name was Herb Pettit. Herb Pettit. <laughs> Everybody called him Herpetic, and it just jumped into my mind. Sorry about that. Does anybody know him? He's a nice guy. All right. Oh, and then the mixed pain syndromes. When we talk about this as being mixed pain, probably really what we should call this is central pain. Remember me talking about that the other day, that really fibromyalgia is not necessarily um, direct damage to a peripheral nerve, but it's a, a mishap of the central nervous system. And that probably goes with myofascial pain syndrome too, okay? Something's not firing right. In the, in the CNS moving out to the periphery. So let's talk about post-op pain. And again, I apologize for cruising so fast, but I just wanna make sure you guys have like the, the nitty gritty of a lot of this stuff, okay? So post-op pain, obviously it's anytime you have acute pain after having a procedure, all right? Pretty easy. Now here's the thing that kind of blows me away is think about how many surgeries we have every year and think about how much pain is experienced following surgery. Now, let me put another monkey wrench into this. Hospitals are measured based on the quality of their outcomes from their surgeries. What's that called? Skip measures? Do I have that right? And so where a lot of this is becoming a problem is one of the skip measures dictating on how well a hospital is paid is how well pain was managed immediately after surgery. HCAPS is the quality. SKIP is readmission, right? And all the other crap that goes into it. You know more than that than I do. 
But anyway, hospitals actually can get their money based on how well pain is managed. All right. So it's we basically turn this into a cost issue as well. And it's not, they're not doing a great job with managing post-operative pain, obviously. I made this. That's supposed to be a scalpel. It's actually a butter knife, but you get the idea, right? This is my graphics design excellence. So, I mean, but it's pretty self-explanatory. You cut into something on the body. It releases inflammatory mediators and cytokines and calcitonin gene-related peptides. And basically what that does is it not only does it cause vascular changes in the local area, but it also sensitizes peripheral neurons and creates a painful response. This is what pain is supposed to look like. This is no susception. This is no susception. And we have a whole host of different areas we can get involved here. We can get involved with in, uh, inhibiting these. We can get involved by trying to slow down the primary afferent nerve. We can also get involved by trying to slow down glutamate being released or where it binds to. So there's, it's just like that first cartoon that I showed you guys before. Okay. Now here's the big argument. You guys all heard of the CDC opioid guidelines, right? This has been pretty big news. And one of the big kind of controversial pieces that they have come out of the CDC guidelines, above and beyond the dose limits of 50 and 90 milligrams a day of morphine equivalents, the other big one is that we're limiting the amount of opioids that we use for acute pain to three days or less and really reconsider how often we let patients stay on opioids for longer than seven days. And so the, the question is, well, is that inhumane? I mean, if you have surgery and you're only gonna give me three days of like Vicodin or Percocet or whatever it might be, well, what can we expect pain-wise? Now, obviously, if you like shatter your leg in a million pieces, that's one thing, okay? But if you have like a, uh, if you have a simple shoulder surgery or maybe you have a laparotomy, or even a post-cesarean section type situation where it's a post-op, the natural order of things when you look at all the data combined is you start to see pain at rest really go down around the day two time period. And the reason they put cough up here is because that's supposed to be kind of pain under exertion. That's supposed to represent exertion. And so really how long do we need to have patients on pain Pulse, number one, and how long do we need to have them on the most potent analgesics that we have? So let's say on day three, on day three here, could we get away with a ibuprofen, naproxen, fill in the blank, right? And so most hospitals now have started to convert people from IV open analgesics, usually after 24 48 hours after surgery, to start to try to get them ready to go home and come off of these medicines. Now, this throws a huge wrench into the works. Can acute pain lead to chronic pain? And the answer is yes, it can. And they've now actually coined a new term called chronic post-surgical pain syndrome. And we see that in a lot of different surgical models. And we think that if we do a good job managing pain immediately post-op, that we can prevent chronic post-surgical pain. The theory is, is that pain begets pain, just like seizures beget seizures and headaches beget headaches. So if we have a bunch of uncontrolled, out-of-this-world severity pain, that can lead to further pain down the road. All right? One of the th ways that we've started to get our arms around this is something called preemptive analgesia. Do you know, are they orthopedics guys doing preemptive analgesia at St. E? A little bit, they do blocks. So the question is, is how do we, what can we do before surgery to try to reduce the amount of pain and complications after surgery? Because that's the easiest time to make an intervention. And so what you'll see is you can do blocks. Like when I had my uh, rotator cuff surgery, they gave me an inner scalene block that basically numbed my entire arm for like two or three days, right? They gave that to me before the incision was actually made. Okay, and you can do all kinds of different blocks and other things as well. 
Now, believe it or not, we can also decrease the CNS sensitivity to pain before the first cut is even made. And so what we're starting to see now is we're starting to see this preemptive analgesia where they may give an NSAID or an antidepressant or an anticonvulsant right before surgery, maybe an hour or two, and usually in a little bit higher doses than what you'd usually see normal, but it's just that one dose. What do you guys think of that? Does that seem like a good idea? What if I told you that doing this in some circumstances could decrease the amount of opioid you needed after surgery by half? What would you guys think of that? Or what if I told you that patients were up in 25 to 30% faster after preemptive analgesia than just regular standard care? Would that impress you? How do I impress you guys? You guys are dead today. All right. So one of the things I told you about, we can put anesthetic directly into the wound. You guys will probably come across, if you haven't already, a drug called Xperil, which is liposomal bupivacaine. And basically what they do is we cut you open, they inject it right in there, usually for knees, I think is where most of the data is, and then they sew you back up. And the lidocaine just keeps making nerves dead wherever you squirted it. Okay. Do you guys know what chondrotoxic means? What's a chondrocyte? cartilage. So chondrotoxic means that local anesthetics can make your cartilage break down. That ain't good, is it? Anything with toxic in it just sounds bad. This is what one of those little catheters look like that we sew right in there. They do this with orthopedic surgeries. They're also starting to do this more with cardiothoracic surgeries. Like if they have to open you up for a heart, oh, sew this bad boy right in. Pharmacists that are going to be working in hospitals, you guys will probably make these. They're called elastomeric balls. And it basically looks like a water balloon. And you fill it up with anesthetic, and then the pressure of the uh, elastomeric device pushes the, the infusate, or whatever you want to call it, out into the wound at a consistent amount over two or three days. And then they just pull the, this little catheter out, and you're good to go. Cool, huh? The fancy name, if you look these up, is the on cue pain pump. Fancy. All right. So how do we do post-op pain control? Post-op pain control should be multimodal. So basically what that means is if all we're doing after you have surgery, so if I make the big cut in you and I'm in there ripping and tearing and cutting and all of that stuff, and then I sew you up and you're going to be in my hospital, how do I keep you from being in excruciating pain immediately afterwards? This should be a host of different things. It can be stuff like anti-inflammatory drugs. It can be things like the lidocaine infusions or, you know, where the, it's going into the wound. It can be things even like TENS machines where you get the little electrical nerve stimulation. But the last thing you want post-operative pain control to be is only an opioid. You do not want it to be only an opioid. I don't want to throw Sainese under the bus, but basically they have post-op pain order sets where basically what they look like is, okay, for mild pain, you get, I don't know, naproxen. Hmm? Okay. Well, then maybe we won't use Sainese as the example. But, I mean, in a normal hospital, it might be, okay, if you're in mild pain, you might a Toradol shot. And if you're in moderate pain, you get one Percocet. And if you're in severe pain, you get two Percocet. Plus, you might get acetaminophen around the clock. Plus, you might get naproxen around the clock. Plus, you, and so it'll add on all these other things. So that's not just one drug being used for the pain management. All right? Now, yes. Hmm. That's a good question. Do they count as, an, as adjunctive medicine? Sure, I think so. I would argue it's not enough acetaminophen to make a difference, but you know we don't have good data to support that statement. 
Now, when you're, if you're the pharmacist and you're responsible for assessing pain control postoperatively for a patient, the next question you want to ask, so if they're like, hey, what do we give this patient? The next question you want to ask is, is the patient opioid naive or opioid tolerant? Is the patient opioid naive or opioid tolerant? Most of your post-op patients are going to be opioid naive. They're not going to have been on opioids before surgery. Okay? The definition of opioid tolerant is 60 milligrams of oral morphine a day or more or its equivalent, just like on the slide. So if you're taking 60 milligrams of oral morphine a day and you've been on that for a week or more, you are considered opioid tolerant. The opioid naive folks are easy because pretty much everybody gets a standard dose. You might get one or two Percocet or Vicodin or maybe even we do a PCA. Do you guys all know what PCA is? Where you get a button and you hit the button and you get some drug and usually it's like every 10 minutes or so. You can get uh, then this patient controlled analgesia can be either intravenous or they can even give it epidurally. Okay, but the, the key take home is, is that if you are opioid naive, the doses are going to be pretty standard. If you are opioid tolerant, you are going to need more drug. Does everybody agree with that? Is it being common sense that if I come into surgery on an opioid, I'm going to need more than that immediately after surgery? And this happens a lot clinically where people are like, oh, they're already on Vicodin from home. We don't need to give them anything else. That's the furthest thing from the truth. Okay? Now, you guys already know the magic number. What is the magic number for breakthrough pain if somebody is already on an opioid? 10%. Okay? There is no difference between that and what we're talking about here. Let me give you an example. Remember our patient that we were talking about on Friday last week, the 60 milligram morphine guy? Let's say our 60 milligram of morphine guy comes in for surgery and he's getting before, so before surgery, he was getting 60 milligrams of long acting three times a day, right? How much is that? Oral morphine equivalent is how much? 180, right? 60 times 3, 180. Okay. Now, we got to make it IV. So now how much is it? 60. And then 10% of that needs to be a breakthrough dose. Would you guys agree? So how much is that? Morphine push should be what that patient gets coming right out of the the um, surge suite. So right after someone gets surgery, they go into a post-anesthesia care unit, and usually there's a nurse waiting there with a syringe or something, like, are you in pain? And you open your eyes, and they're like, ready to stick you. And, but how do they know how much to give you? If it, well, I'm assuming you're not on opioids, just, right? You're not? Okay. So if it were you or I, we'd probably get, what do you think, two milligrams push or its equivalent? And be like, okay, how do you feel now? All right, our, our guy I just gave you the example of, two milligrams ain't going to cut it. He's going to need more. How much is he going to need? Six. Does that make sense how I got to those numbers? Easy sneezy. And then you repeat it based on how often you need it. Okay? Any questions on post-op pain? So let me ask you guys this. Based on what we played around with in those things, our, we're getting 60 milligrams. Our, our guy was getting 60 milligrams IV equivalent, our little sample guy. So let's say that he's going to come in for surgery, and instead of giving him push, IV push, we want to put him basal and bolus PCA, right? So basal would be like an infusion, like a drip. And then the bolus would be the button. How much per hour would he need? If he was 60 milligrams IV per day, what would his hourly rate be? What's 60 divided by 24? Roughly two and some change? 
2.5. So that's how we would do that. We would put him on a PCA. Adam, jump, jump out and yell if I'm lying to him. You do this every day. Basils are bad unless they're opioid tolerant, right? But you're dealing with my slew docs, right? Okay. Well, whatever. You guys are doing it wrong. So, but the bottom line is, is if we're going to do that, we're replacing what the patient was already on. So their IV infusion per hour would be two and a half milligrams, right? And then their hour, like their button push, generally speaking, is 50% to 100% of the hourly rate. So instead of giving six milligrams IV push, let's say every two or four hours, now we're going to give them, I don't know, one to two milligrams of IV morphine each time they hit the button every 10 minutes. Does that make sense how that's happening? Okay. Yeah, stay away from basal rates and drips unless your patient is opioid tolerant. Let's talk about cancer pain. This slide's a hot mess, and it's meant to be a hot mess because it's supposed to be giving you guys the feeling that there is more to cancer pain than just the nociceptive process that's going on, okay? It is a, a, it is a sense of suffering. It's what we call holistic pain, and there's a whole host of variables that go into the severity of this. Now, since, because of time, I don't want to spend a lot of uh, time going through like the barriers to appropriate cancer pain management, but let me share with you that of the patients that they've surveyed, right, and this should be, this should be our population we're the least worried about, right, getting into trouble with opioids. Like, let's, let's hit these folks as aggressively as we can to make them comfortable is kind of my attitude. We still have huge amounts of under and untreated cancer pain in the U.S., even with all the stuff we know and all the drugs that we have available to us. And a lot of the barriers to appropriate treatment really stem from us, the healthcare system. And the incidence of, of severe pain in cancer management um, does not appear to be getting any better, which to me is astounding. So when we talk about cancer pain, we have two basic types. We have the, the cancer pain that is directly related to the tumor or the cancer process or the malignancy. And then we have the pain that is related to the, the treatments that we're using to treat the cancer, which is awful to me that the stuff that we use to treat this disorder can be an etiology of chronic pain. A lot of the, the drugs that you'll learn about in HEMOC can, be, uh, can contribute to painful di uh, painful neuropathies extensively. Radiation treatment can cause uh, neuropathic pain as well. Tumor can directly get involved in tissue, bone, nerve. So really any situation where we have uh, innervation or um, invasion by malignancy can result in pain. But these are the two basic types. It's either tumor associated or it's treatment associated. The World Health Organization came up with a treatment paradigm because so many patients were getting under-treated pain, and it basically meant, hey, start with the, with the easiest that we got and just keep escalating in, in uh, aggressiveness of pain treatment until you get the patient comfortable. That's basically what this WHO analgesic ladder is all about. This is common sense, gang. I don't think you need to go home and review this slide. This is normal stepped care. And I would even argue, remember we talked about headache step versus stratified. My argument would be is we don't even need to do stepped care in cancer pain management. If it were my mom, stratified. If she's 10 out of 10 pain from cancer, don't give her acetaminophen and send her home, right? I want you to be aggressive. What would you do for your mom? And that needs to be kind of the way that you ask yourself about a lot of these different interventions. Now, pain crisis, cancer pain crisis, should really be treated differently than the average normal emergency room visit where a patient comes in and is having 
kidney stones or what have you. I think it should be treated much more aggressively, okay? And really what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna focus on one strategy. There's two strategies listed here, but I wanna focus and spend a minute on the most important one. And you guys will hear this term a lot in HEMOC. NCCN stands for the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. That is basically the Bible, the guidelines around cancer management in the United States. So if I were you, I wouldn't even pay much attention to the Cleveland Clinic method. I just want you to know it exists. So walk through this vignette with me. I have a patient who has, let's say, prostate cancer with metastases. It's in the hip, in the arms, in the vertebrae, and it is incredibly painful. We have this patient under relatively decent pain control, but sometimes these cancer pain syndromes can flare, and we call that a cancer pain crisis, okay? And they come into the ER. Come into the ER, and really the way that this should work is they shouldn't sit there for six hours while they get triaged and the normal ER wait. They should be brought back immediately, immediately. And they need to be, depending on whether they're opioid naive or opioid tolerant, just like we mentioned a minute ago, if they're opioid naive, this is what you do based on the NCCN method. You give them somewhere between two and five milligrams IV push of morphine, or if it's equivalent, boom, push it. Fast push, and then you check back with them in 15 minutes. I want you to get, this is important stuff, and you guys will see this again, I think, on your case, all right? You give the dose somewhere between two and five, you reassess them in 15 minutes, 15 minutes. And then you change it based on what they tell you their pain score is after that. So if, they, if it's 10 out of 10 and you give them two milligrams of IV morphine and they come back in 15 minutes and you check them and it's still 10 out of 10, you double the dose. Do you guys see that at the bottom there? You increase the dose. It doesn't have to be exactly double, but it needs to be increased. And you keep doing this until you get them under control. So a hot, would, would a hospice nurse be qualified to do this at home? Technically, unless it was specifically written out in their order sets, no. Because then that would be considered nurse prescribing. Okay, but we do have some hospice collaborative agreements that are set up where PharmDs can do this. Okay, great question. So if you're asked, NCCN is the preferred method, you give the drug, you reassess in 15 minutes. If the pain has gone down to between a four, to, four and six out of 10, you just repeat the same dose you gave. If it hasn't, you increase the dose, and if you got them where you want them to be, that's their magic dose for while they're in the hospital. Is that pretty straightforward? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great question. So most of the patients are not going to be opioid naive. So how are we going to figure out, how are we going to figure out that first dose to give? Great segue, I didn't even pay her. You figure out all the drug they're on. Let's say it's our 60 milligram guy. Fair enough. If it's our milligram guy, what dose should he get as his very first dose? Six milligrams, I keep push. And if that doesn't bring his pain down to a below what, seven, eight? If it doesn't bring it down below eight, you increase it and you go again. Adam? You agree? Is this, you see this done? No, yeah, that's true. But you guys get the general gist, right? Are you feeling a little more comfortable with like how we come up with some of this stuff? Okay. Now, here's the big piece with this. Now, and it's tough for me to just jump back and forth between chronic non-malignant pain and cancer pain. But cancer pain management, hospice pain management is a completely different beast. And we have certain tenets that we try to stick to. 
or tenants, excuse me, I didn't say it right. That is that we want to control the baseline and we want to control breakthrough. And we're going to do that however we need to get there. All right? And we want to do it with the least invasive measures that we have. And you always, always provide immediate release opioid for breakthrough pain. Okay? Breakthrough pain is going to happen a lot in cancer. It's going to happen a lot. And it can happen for a number of different reasons. And this is important to remember, too. It can happen because your long-acting drug is wearing off, led into dose failure. It can happen because I'm doing something to you, like bathing you, moving you, uh, affecting some area that's, that's uh, been involved by the tumor. Or it can be true, spontaneous, idiopathic breakthrough pain. And that happens. The general rule of thumb, the general rule of thumb is if I have to use more than four breakthrough doses a day, it's time to adjust my long acting. If I have to use more than four breakthrough doses a day, it's probably time to start looking at increasing the long acting medicine. This picture is worth a thousand words. The reason we don't cover all of the pain with long acting is if we do, we snow them. And we saw that with our Suboxone patient this morning, right? We covered all of her pain and she couldn't stay awake. And so we had to dial it down. And unfortunately, she was in some pain. But if you're, if you're completely covering all of it, you're given too much. This is ideal. This is ideal. This blue line where you're covering most of it and you have four or less breakthrough episodes a day. And we can cover that with immediate release drug. Make sense? We good? The most terrible type of cancer pain to have, from what I'm told, is bone lesions. Bone pain is what we call it. It is incredibly hard to treat. So this is when cancer has metastasized to the bone. And you would think that what we do is just hit them as hard and as fast as we can with opioid. And we do do that. But the interesting thing is, is that because this type of pain is more cytokine mediated, that we actually want to make sure that we actually have anti-inflammatory or bisphosphonate therapy involved too. And I think it's important we talk about that, even though this isn't hemonc. So if you have really significant bone metastases like are shown on this bone scan here, we want to be aggressive with those. And really what we can do is we can use NSAID therapy. And it sounds crazy. A lot of people are like, they're on morphine. Why do we need to add ibuprofen? It is almost more effective for bone pain than an opioid. If the prognosis of the patient is not good, we'll frequently go to a corticosteroid at that point and hit them really hard with steroids. The bisphosphonates are very beneficial. And in fact, if you have uh, bone metastases, we'll frequently use uh, zolindronic acid for metastasy-related pain. Denosumab is a newer one. It's pretty expensive, but I'm seeing that pop up more and more for treatment of cancer uh, bone mets. Okay? Opioids probably still will be needed, but those aren't the main player. First question I ask when someone from the hospice calls, that are, oh, we can't get their pain under control. They've got this terrible bone mets all over the place. I'm asking, are they on NSAID or are they on dexamethasone? First question, every time. Don't get, don't get hung up on this. This is just there in case you need it. Kind of put down underneath. I'm not going to ding you too hard on this stuff. I just want you to know that there are non-opioid alternatives. This is more of a in case you need it later. And you guys will hear all about this in HEMOC. Okay? We treat chemo-induced neuropathic pain exactly like we would any other neuropathic pain syndrome. So if you feel comfortable going after diabetic peripheral neuropathy, we'll hit it exactly the same way. Uh, 
uh, mucositis is one of the real painful um, one of the real painful pain syndromes associated with cancer. Uh, we'll do all kinds of weird stuff like swish and swallow magic potions and mouthwashes, and we'll even use morphine uh, swish and spit for things like this. Just know that it's basically oral mucosa or other mucosa uh, breakdown, usually from the drug. Let's talk about OA. Guys, This is the rest of these are going to be mostly You've heard it all before from me probably three or four times now, either in self-care or GI room. Osteoarthritis, primarily due to breakdown in uh, cartilage. It's uh, thought to be an overuse injury, but you can actually see it without overuse. Um, this is the guidelines. This looks nasty, but if you look at it and kind of you know, take a step back, really the drugs that we're thinking about when they break this up for hand OA, hip OA, and knee OA, the drugs we typically think about, acetaminophen, topical NSAIDs, oral NSAIDs, right? It's all the usual players. You'll notice that there's either no recommendation or no conditional no for opioids. You'll notice that for oral NSAIDs, basically all of them is a yes, except for hand osteoarthritis, where they don't want you to be over 75 in order to get it. I mean, is this, this is kind of self-explanatory, right? It's like the normal stuff we would think of. As new OA guidelines come out, what I'm finding is they keep Every time they come out, there's ORSI and ACR, and there's a million different guidelines. Every time we get a new one, it seems like they're moving topical NSAIDs higher and higher up in their like, recommendation level. So I think that's really where things are going to be going, especially for the more superficial, the more superficial OA. Hip OA is probably not going to respond really well to topical NSAID therapy. You guys are doing good. You're almost done. Right? Hang in there with me. Low back pain. <clears throat> Here's your take homes. The worst thing that can happen with somebody that has low back pain is they can have something called cauda equina syndrome. You guys ever heard that? Spinal stenosis or cauda equina. All right? Your risk is, is that you can become paralyzed or you can have permanent neurogenic or uh, neurologic deficits from this. So do I think pharmacists can actually play a role in this? I do, and that's why I include this in this lecture. All right, here are your red flags. Worsening radicular pain, that's pain shooting down your leg or your arm. For cauda equina, it would be your leg. Loss of control of your urine or your bowel, that's a big one. Or if you can't pee, so if you have really bad urine retention. Something called saddle anesthesia. Imagine where your behind would touch a saddle if you were riding a horse. If you have worsening numbness in that area, that's a bad sign for somebody with low back pain. The way I bring it up, hey, are you numb anywhere your underpants touch you? Same kind of thing, right? Except for when they're like, I'm not wearing any. That, remember that old guy? And I was like, ooh. Okay. Something called drop foot. So when you dorsiflex your foot to heel toe walk, that is an L5 S1 and an L yeah, L5 S1 mediated reflex in order to bring your toe up and move. So people that can't dorsiflex their foot have what's called drop foot and they'll swing their leg way out because they can't heel toe. And I I don't I got to tell them about the last one, but right? The anal wink. So if you go to the ER and they suspect spinal canal stenosis or cauda equina, there, there is a L5-S1 mediated reflex where the behind will wink at you if you stroke the side of the anus with your finger. And they call that a peri, perianal reflex or the anal wink. And, that, and I actually went in, because we caught this in clinic one day, and I went into the teach room to the attending, and I'm like, I'd like to 
direct admit this patient to neurosurgery for eval. And there, she was like, I'm not doing that unless you do an anal wink. And I'm like, well, then we're not direct admitting the patient. We'll send him to the ER. And I went back and asked the guy, I'm like, this is what they want me to do. He's like, I'll just go to the ER. You're not doing that. But that is one of the signs. I'm not lying. So if you think about it, low back pain, really, how can it come? So this is a cross section of a vertebral body. This is the central canal. This is your nerve. This is your, your, this is like your, uh, I'm having a brain fart, your spinal cord. And off of the spinal cord comes these nerve roots, and this is your disc. And so the disc can either push directly on the spinal canal, or it can push on these nerve roots coming out. So these people who say, I have back pain shooting down into my legs, have you guys ever heard of that before? Some people call it sciatica, which is not technically correct, right? Okay. Um, that's ridiculous pain that's coming from something pin impinging on either the spinal cord or the exiting nerve root. And somebody who's really good diagnostician can actually probably pinpoint what level, what L, L or thoracic spine level this is coming from based on the pattern of the pain shooting down their leg, right? Okay. But my big one I want you to remember is those red flags. Don't worry about all of this garbage. Okay, physical therapy and manipulation, um, I believe in it, gang. Oh, we have docs, we have DOs at our clinic called Doctors of Osteopathic Medicine, and they do something called osteopathic manipulation therapy. It's similar to chiropractic manipulation. I don't want to offend anybody who might be in the audience that might have a pro or a con approach to this, but it works, okay, and it really helps these folks out whether it's chiropractic or OMT. We do acupuncture or did, and that helps. So anything that comes about that helps these patients. The biggest thing, the biggest thing you can tell your patient, regardless of all the evidence that's out there, whether it's NSAIDs and opioids and skeletal muscle relaxants, none of which has good long-term data, the most important thing you can tell them is stay active. Don't lay on the couch and quit moving. Hide, hide all this stuff. It's unimportant. You can come back to it. Surgical, hide. Interventional, hide. Pharmacotherapy, nothing works. That basically nothing works. Period. We have no good long-term data. Short-term NSAIDs, skeletal muscle relaxants, exactly what you would think. But long-term, we have no data. We've talked about DPN. Here's your guidelines. Anything look surprising up there to you? I'm not going to be like, tell me what guideline level this drug is. I want you to have a general idea of where things fit. Would you recommend pregabalin for diabetic neuropathy, or would you recommend ibuprofen? You catch my drift? All right, very good. You guys are great. Fibromyalgia, same kind of deal. Okay, this is a real disorder. We have specific diagnostic criteria for this. Don't get hung up on the diagnostic criteria. The general take home is I want you guys to know this is not all in their head. This is an actual centrally mediated pain syndrome that causes pain all over the body. These are your guidelines for drugs. Nothing here is surprising. Antidepressants, you bet. Anticonvulsants, absolutely. The only ones that might be a little surprising to you up here is these drugs right here, Pramipexol and some of the serotonin antagonists. Nobody uses those in practice. They primarily use duloxetine, pregabalin, Savella, or milnasopram. I feel like you guys have, I'm sorry, I think I ran a minute two minutes over. I think you guys have a good grasp based on your collective responses to the questions. I, I feel like you guys have it. We're going to do this case thing uh, later the week, in the week, I think Friday, Thursday. Are you sure it's on Thursday? Um, and, and, the rest, and the really important things will be hammered home within that case. As far as your exam is concerned in here, I feel very good. The questions are already done and submitted. I feel very good that the main take-homes that you guys have grasped from Friday and today are 
there's there's not going to be any curveballs or odd things on there. It's all very straightforward. I think you all have got the main stuff. I promise. Scouts honor. Question. Eight. Palliative care exam is at eight. Any other questions about this or any other stuff? Any pain, non-pain? While we're here. Okay, let's, is there a class in here after this? All right, let's wrap it up so Dr. Ronald can get going then. Thank you guys for sticking with me.